scriptures, starting at verse 12 in Philippians chapter 3. That's where we're going to be this morning. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if, any, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory is in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. May we hear what it is you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been away from Philippians for about a month and we come back to it here at the end of chapter 3. It's in the end of his letter is fast approaching. By the end of June, we're going to be done with what Paul has shared with the church in Philippi. And we've learned a great deal so far, at least I hope that we have, as we've walked through this letter rather slowly, just trying to understand what it is Paul was telling us. Paul has taught us the importance of being in community. For those of us who think we can go it alone, we need to remember that we can't. We need to gather together at least once a week in community. We've learned that, that that's important, that Paul had support because he had people that he was with. That his prison time had been put to his advantage, actually, because he had used his prison cell not as a place in which he could complain about what was going on, but rather he used his prison cell as a pulpit. Talking so much about Jesus and the reason why it was he was there, the guards even realized that he wasn't there for anything other than the Roman government couldn't shut his mouth up, so they did their best to lock him up. Instead, he just continued to share with people about who Jesus was, witnessing to everybody that he could. We learn that living in this life is great and that we ought to do so. It's one of the things that Paul encourages us to do, to enjoy God's good earth and good world and that we should be lights in a dark place. But he also told us that dying and being with Jesus was actually far better. Very weird concept, I know, because talking about death seems to be that topic that nobody, especially in our country, wants to deal with. But nobody gets out of this life alive. One out of one of us will finally have that day where we will be no more. It happens to every single one of us. And Paul says that that's a joyous thing for those who are in Christ. Then that beautiful poem that he wrote in chapter 2 of Philippians that he gave us, that it paints such a clear picture of King Jesus and what it was he left in glory in order to come down here to do the things that he did in order that we could have a way home and have a relationship with the Father. Such a beautiful thing that we got to look at there. We should never take our salvation for granted. We should never assume that it's a one and done type of thing. But rather, we ought to be dying to ourselves every single day, Paul tells us. And working out that salvation with fear and trembling. Making sure that we are doing and growing every single day in a way that glorifies Jesus and edifies those who belong to him and reaches those who don't know who he is. Because Jesus gave all for us, why would we not take a deep breath and understand that we ought to give all for him? Paul wants us to understand that. And then we learned about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Two friends for the journey. Once again, being encouraged to remember that it is never good to go it alone. That we need to have friends that can be with us. Two men who are under Paul's direction and his care and his supervision and his mentorship. They grew in service and pastoral care understanding to the point where they were such a great service to all those in the body that while Paul didn't want to let them go, he made sure that they were in places that they would serve people in a way that they were trained. We left off almost a month ago, in fact, with Paul reminding us that while heaven is a great place to head to, it is not the end-all, be-all prize. It is not the end of all things. The prize, Paul tells us, is Jesus himself. We are to be striving for him, our king, and the resurrection from the dead. That is the end-all, be-all. 
This notion that it's all about heaven and harps on clouds and trying to figure out what we're going to do for eternity, being bored out of our skull because we don't know how to play a tune on a harp, is not at all what the Bible ever tells us. We've been taught incorrectly if we think heaven is the end game. It's not. And that's what Paul tells us here. It is the hope that we look for. The hope of the resurrection and the return of Jesus. What we call the blessed hope. The return of our King. When He comes back and we will always and forever be in the presence of the One who died and rose for us on our behalf. Paul teaches us that. And finally this morning as we get into chapter 3 and we look at verse 12 down through 21, he picks right up there again as he tries to bring himself back down to earth after talking about all these wonderful things that he has been looking at and trying to teach us. He brings us back down into the practical. Back down into the nitty gritty and the tough stuff here in chapter 3. And he helps us to do the same as we walk through that. He reminds us never to think too much of ourselves. And he uses himself as an example, which I always find that to be good. He wants everybody to know that he struggles with the same things that he's trying to teach those who are reading his letter. We are never to think too highly of ourselves, but neither are we to think too little of ourselves. Think that through. It's quite the balancing act, really, in a world that is so narcissistic that everybody knows what I had for dinner for the last six months, and I really hope I get a thousand likes on what it is I've cooked. We have to find that balance as we journey through life, working out our salvation, understanding that I don't want to get too much of a fat head, but neither do I want to minimize the gifts and the call that God has placed upon my life and how it is He has me working that out. Because even Paul, as he wrote, understood that even he, that great apostle, wasn't quite there yet. This is why he writes to us starting in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What we see here with Paul is he is working it out. And he's doing it as he writes down on the paper. He no longer accepts what he actually thought was true, that he was perfect, that he was blameless. We learn that in chapter 3 at the beginning. He no longer accepts that. And he understands that he has to constantly be working that out as he is pressing on and pressing forward. And Tim Keller in his book, Hope in Times of Fear, I've been reading this throughout the last couple months. He wrote this in 2020, uh, just in relation to the pandemic and everything. But he talks about the resurrection and, and what it means for us to see Easter and what Jesus did. And he actually talks about Paul when Paul is saying these types of things. And he says this, Paul has seen the Bible as a series of laws and moral stories that told you how to live so you could merit God's blessing. How many of us think that? If when you're asked, why do you know you're saved, you start ticking off all of the things that you do, I want to challenge you to understand that you don't really know what it means to be saved. The Bible says you don't need to do anything to be saved. I am saved because of what Jesus did, not because I checked off a whole bunch of boxes. We learned that when we were visiting with Paul last time. But it's hard for us to do that, isn't it? We're performance-based people. Keller continues, he says, but when he, Paul, grasped the stubborn fact of the resurrection of Jesus, he began to reread the Bible with a Christ-centered framework, and everything looked different. The Bible is not a series of Aesop's fables telling us how to live a good life, Keller says. Instead, it is a single, coherent history, a wonderfully true story about the ways God was bringing salvation into the world, ways that all climaxed in Jesus Christ. And then he says, once Paul began to look at everything in light of Jesus, resurrected and vindicated by God, and again, this is chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Philippians, he maps this all out. The Bible fit together, and everything in the world and in his life looked different. It looked different. And here's the key. Certainly, he had not worked out all the implications of this in the three days after his Damascus Road experience. Nor had he figured out all the answers to his original objections to Christianity. So if you're sitting here today and you can't figure it out, you're in great company. 
If you don't have the answers to all the questions that this world poses to you or somebody who is asking you about Jesus, if you don't have those answers, you're in great company. You don't have to have all the answers. We are not the shell answer people. We are Christians journeying to the celestial city, as Bunyan would say. Once he realized Jesus was risen, he knew there had to be answers to all of the objections. So he believed in Christ. He began to preach, and he proceeded to work out the details as he went along. In other words, working out his salvation. He did not have to have all of the answers. But he understood that because Jesus rose, somewhere along the line, things would make sense, and there would be answers. None of us have obtained perfection. None of us have. None of us have figured that all out in our salvation or a full grasp of it all. Even I still struggle as much as I have grown over the years. In many ways, I still have a hard time understanding why God has called me and what it is he's done in my life and how it is he's done those things. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, though. I told you two weeks ago that I would stake my life on it. And because I know that, I don't need to have the answers for all of the other questions, but I know that this little Jewish carpenter who was dead, he is alive. And he is resurrected and he is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And that's sufficient for me. And it should be sufficient for you. Don't ever let anybody tell you that it's not. Perhaps you can't explain that away, but that's all right. We keep at it every single day. We trust that God has us in the palm of his hand. You see, one of the most important things to remember, and this is a little difficult, but one of the most important things to remember is what we are supposed to forget, sorting out the things that we are actually to leave behind. Now, I talked last week about not forgetting the things in the past, so we have to sort this out a little bit. Because too often, too many of us in our lives, as we are growing in Christ, live in the what-if moments. Too many of us too often in our lives, live in the I have never gotten this right feeling in our soul. That I just am not going to be able to get it. The last time I gave this a go, it was a complete disaster. Or we are somehow held to that last big mistake we made and we never think we can grow beyond that. And we never think that God can use us again because of something that we've done in the past. Far too often we hold on to those things a lot tighter than we ought to. These things can freeze us in place. They can put us in a spot that we can never move forward because we end up beating ourselves up until our self-esteem and all of the things that we've got going on is absolutely non-existent. Having such a low view of ourselves that we can't ever seem to move forward and can never trust that God could ever use us for anything at all in this life. We don't want to ever be there. You see, Paul never suffered from that. He never suffered from that. Even though in Christ, he knew he still didn't understand it all. Paul didn't suffer from a low view of himself. It was a proud, high view, and a very big opinion of himself. That's why when Jesus encountered him, he had to knock him off his high horse. Because Paul wouldn't have been brought in any other way. You never remember when we were last here in this letter, we learned that because Paul talked about all of these things. There was not one person on planet Earth at that time that needed to tell Paul he was the best at everything he did. Paul knew he was the best at everything he did. That's what he wrote to us at the beginning of chapter 3. Before Jesus, he had a pretty fat head. But now, he was wrestling with. And he was learning that as good as he was, it all amounted to what? What did I tell you a month ago? It all amounted to poo. Just a big old pile of dung. Everything that he had ever done that he thought would make God happy with him amounted to nothing but garbage. Compared to Jesus, once he understood that this little Jewish carpenter had risen from the dead, nothing in his life equated to what it was Jesus has done for him. Paul realized at that moment that he didn't have anything to offer. And the beauty of the call that God placed upon his life was he didn't have to have anything to offer except a, yes, Lord, I will do what you ask. 
And just because he didn't have anything to offer, we also need to remember that that doesn't make him nothing. That doesn't make him nothing. He didn't walk around going, oh, I'm really bad. (laughs) False humility is nothing but pride in disguise. That's all that is. False humility is nothing but pride in disguise. Walking around beating yourself up so you can somehow feel good about yourself displeases the Lord as much as walking around with a massively fat head. We don't want to do either. If you are good at something in this world, own it. Own it. Because it is God who has made you good at that in this world. Now don't go, you know, broadcasting it everywhere, but own it. He is the one who gave it to you. Remember what James wrote to us when he he said this, that every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift. That means even those who don't know Jesus, who do good things in this world, guess what? That good gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights. He doesn't change, the Bible tells us. There's no variation in him of shadow due to any kind of change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. To minimize God's gift in you is to minimize God and his purpose and his desire and his direction for you in your life. Be careful. Be careful that you don't do that. Don't ever minimize what he gives you. And at the same time, we need to remember what Paul says, that we count it all rubbish in order to gain Jesus. That ultimately... None of it really matters as long as we have Jesus. Perspective and gratefulness will always keep us standing right where we need to be before God in our journey in this world. How it is we see ourselves in this world. You see, the goal is to be conformed to his likeness, and Paul understood that. That's why he wrote to the Roman church that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who have been called according to his purpose. He got that because his life was a train wreck, and yet God used it to glorify his name. But we always forget to move on to verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Find a balance. We are to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Find the balance. Stop comparing yourself to others. Don't do it. I say it over and over again, but we live in a world where if you take five minutes to watch commercials, everybody is telling you how you ought to be and how you should judge yourself and by what standard and you got to be like this or you got to be like that. Don't do it. Do not compare yourself to others ever. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it's very easy for every one of us, if we're honest, to find somebody worse than ourselves. I can always make myself feel better by walking down the street and finding things wrong with everybody else. Now, maybe I'm the only one that has to fight with that every day, but nonetheless, I can always find somebody who is worse than I am. And I can say to those who are telling me, you really need to make a change in your life, I can go, yeah, but you know what? I'm not like them. Look at how bad they are. Now, I don't think anyone else does that. It's probably just me. Problem with that is that if we're also honest with ourselves, I can always find someone who's far better than I am. And if I constantly judge myself on that slide rule, I'm going to be on the roller coaster of life trying to figure out how to get from Monday to Tuesday because I'm not as good as this person, but I'm a little bit better than that one. No, we can't do that. We can't do that. If you constantly, constantly, constantly do that, we're going to give ourselves in trouble. See, Paul here in these verses is very concerned with our perspective. How it is we see ourselves not in light of the world and not in relation to the others around us, but in relation to Jesus himself. The standard you measure yourself with every day is Jesus, not anyone else. We don't play the game, the comparison game. We don't do any of that absolute joy, complete joy, the joy of the Lord that the Apostle Paul has in this letter is found when we can be settled in our spirits before him. That's why Paul was so happy in the prison cell. Because he knew that he knew that he knew that that was exactly where God wanted him. All right? Pulpit time, people. I don't care if I'm locked up. 
this is where I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do because this is where God's got me to be. Nope, I'm not out there building churches. Nope, I'm not out there getting this or that. No, it's just pulpit time right here. Paul knew, and that's why he was full of joy because his striving to please God ceased when we understand that in Christ we have all that we need to be and have all we need to succeed in this world. We strive towards being more like Jesus. We press on in being more like him. Then the world sees that, look at that person really doesn't care what anybody thinks of them. They're just out there trying to please this little Jewish carpenter who everybody thinks has been dead for 2,000 years, but they're screaming at the top of their voice, no, he's not dead. Press on, Paul says. Press on. I press on, he tells everybody, toward the goal for the prize. And what's the prize? Heaven? Harps? Clouds? No. I press on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Look to the prize. Look to that. What is it right now? It is the upward call of God in your life in Christ. How are you seeing yourself in light of Jesus? And then how we see others in light of him as well. You see, I can't be kind to a human being who I think is a jerk if I'm looking at them through my eyes. But if I see them in light of Jesus, ah, that shows me a whole different perspective. That shows me a whole different perspective. Look to the prize. Doing it right in our lives every day, we find personal maturity and we have corporate unity. Personal maturity, corporate unity. It's no longer my agenda. It's no longer my wants. It's no longer my desires. It is about making much of Jesus. It's the only string I've got on my banjo is this little Jewish carpenter named Jesus who's seated at the right hand of God the Father. Healthy, mature Christians never play one off against another. Healthy, mature Christians never play one off against another for personal gain, for personal pleasure, or for selfish motives. We don't play those games. One of the things I fight with the hardest every day is I am a master manipulator. It's what kept me safe as a child. And I have to fight that every day because it is not a healthy, mature Christian who plays one off against another. We don't do that. Why? Because the love of God that is found in Jesus. That's what makes me better. The example that Jesus left for us in chapter 2, if we revisit that in a way of serving this body, we are actually served. If we say, Lord, put me in the place you want me to be, we actually end up being served. And I know that that's much easier said than done. I'm 35 years into this Christian walk and I still ain't got it right. I mean, God has a sense of humor, right? Look to the left of you, look to the right. Look at me and let's be honest. God's got a sense of humor. He has to. He's put us all together personalities, different backgrounds, different degrees of brokenness, different ways of doing things, different ways of seeing things, different ways of handling pressure. When you're squeezed, how do you respond in a bad situation? I could go on and on and on and on and on. How does that look for us? And yet, he puts us here as a corporate body of believers and says, hey, go attack the world and let everybody know about Jesus. Y'all going to work together because this is, this is the group that I've got for St. Albans. I say again, he has a very good sense of humor. It's no wonder that he told us to work it out. Because not only do we work all these things out, but we are to extend grace to those who miss the mark. We are to extend grace to those who miss the mark because we are not all in the same place. We are not all in the same place. Our gifts are not all the same. We do not have the same level of spiritual maturity. We don't have the same reference points on our journey in this life with Jesus. We don't. We are all dealing with different things. We're all in different places. And it is those who are more mature in their journey with Christ who are actually the ones who are to extend more grace. It's those who are farther along, doing so first, whether it is actually asked of them or not. Because a sure sign of Christian maturity is this. It is the ability to overlook an offense, to extend forgiveness, and to let go of things in a very good, healthy, and proactive way. Forgetting what is behind. Those are the things that we forget. Solomon was a pretty wise guy. He said this. A wise guy in a good way. 
Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it's to his glory to overlook an offense. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. I have that underlined about a hundred times in my Bible because I got to go there all the time because I don't have any sense. (laughs) And I got to work it through. How quickly do we go from zero to absolutely irate? (laughs) Please don't raise your hand. Just think it through. How quickly do we go from zero to irate because we don't like something? And yet at the same time, how quick are we to forget when something goes wrong? You see, if we were to nail one thing down that I, you, and the rest of this world struggles with, I would challenge you that it is with this. It is with this. You see, this is different than remembering our history. For these are the things that we have to forget, our old self before Jesus. Let's just take a minute and look at the news feed. We are quick to anger. We're quick to insult. We are quick to tribe off. We are quick to never forget an offense. All the things that Solomon tells us we shouldn't do in order that we can experience the glory of God, we seem to master and do on a daily basis. On a daily basis. Now back to Paul. Because verses 15 and 16 seem to level things out for us. And they focus us. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. See, if you're mature, okay. That's what Paul's saying. Think and act that way. Don't run a flag up the flagpole. Just do what you're supposed to do. Press on. If you aren't quite there yet, that's okay. Keep at it. Press on. Don't cry in your soup. Understand that in Jesus you are growing forward just like other people are. God will show you how to work these things out as you go along. Remember Keller? Paul didn't have all the answers, but man, he plugged away. I'm sure he regretted his argument with Barnabas and his rejection of Mark later on in life, but he pressed on. Paul didn't have all the answers, but he was working it out as he went. I want to encourage you, don't be something or someone that you are not. I want to say that again. Don't be something or someone that you're not. Don't play the comparison game in this life. Know yourself in relation to how far you have grown in Jesus. Know yourself and how far you have grown in Jesus. Live up to that. Because that's your baseline. That's all God requires of you. If you have hit this mark, live up to that. He's not going to judge you for something way up here that you can't figure out yet. But if you're here, live up to that. That's what Paul is saying. That's your starting point in your maturity and your walk with Christ. You cannot be less than that anymore. If he has brought you that far, at least live up to that and thank God for it. Hold true to that. Because if you do so on a daily basis, what the scripture tells us is that your maturity will come within your faithfulness to live up to what it is he has already taught you. And then you'll begin to grow beyond where you are right now. And that's the point that Paul's trying to make. The only person that you need to be better than tomorrow is who you are today. That is the only person you need to be better than. You don't need to be better than me. You don't need to be better than the person sitting next to you. You don't need to be better than your spouse. The only person you've got to be better than is who you are today. That's your goal for tomorrow. And all of this is essential because Paul now takes a bit of a turn starting in verse 17 when he says, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Listen, you're going you're gonna to need all of this. So imitate me, he tells them. Keep your eyes on those who are farther along than you. Look for a mentor. Find a mentor. Remember discipleship. Stay in community. Get to church on Sunday. Yeah, your pastor's saying that. Get to church on Sunday. 
Why do I say that? Because Paul says that. We are much better together than we are apart. The challenge here is to understand that healthy community in the church, and then we can launch out into the wider world in St. Albans, and we can be genuinely prepared to handle the things that come our way. Small groups are absolutely essential. It's one of the things that we have very little of here at Church of the Rock, but it's part of the vision piece of growing those small groups again so discipleship can happen, so that we can send people out into the world. Listen, if you don't have a mentor, if you don't have a discipleship group, if you don't have somebody that you can go to that can talk to you, that can help you and can pray for you, find someone. Give someone space in your life for that. I can tell you there's three or four guys sitting in this worship center right now who I trust with my very life. And were it not for them and their prayers, I would not be where I am today. Find somebody. See, these things are important because the only way we're ever going to correctly handle our actual enemies, the only way we're going to ever understand them is this. Paul says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as what? Enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory is in their shame with minds set on earthly things. That's a tough verse. And I'm running out of time very quickly here, but this is important. We don't fight with them. We don't belittle them. We don't ridicule them. We don't demean them. The world does that. And when the church does it, it sets a very poor example of who Jesus is. Paul here is so deeply affected and heartbroken that people actually live as he once lived, as enemies of the cross of Christ, so much so that he can't even write this down without tears flowing down his cheeks because people hate Jesus. Now I want to ask you a question. Don't raise your hand, but take this home and think about this because I've been thinking about this myself. Are any of us sitting in here today that broken in heart? That we weep because people don't know Jesus. Any of us. If you do, help me, because I don't. And I want to. I want to be that convicted. I want to be that concerned. I want us to hope. I want us to pray. I want us to desire revival. And yet far too often we can't even get ourselves to service here on Sunday. Paul is in tears here because he knows the eternal end of these people and it's not a good end. He understands that knowledge. In fact, like Jesus, he is broken for those who hate Christ and his cross. Jesus wept for those. We should be praying, Father, break our hearts for what breaks yours. That's what we should be doing. That's why I get so frustrated when we spend so much time with stupid politics and the ways of this world. We should be asking the Father, break our hearts for what breaks yours. May we see the lost, not as the enemy, but as the lost sheep, the prodigal children, just like we were before you found us. We were all prodigals once. We were all that one sheep on the back 40 and the Father's going, yeah, there he is again. I to leave the 99 to go get that one. He's always back there. We were all that. Paul understands their end is also their choice. And that is as sad as it may seem because they are focused on earthly things. They aren't focused on the things of Christ. They're satisfied with the earthly nature of humanity and arguing with each other to the point that they find great glory in the shameful things they do. Now, all of us can look at the world and go, yep, that's the way it is, but does it break our heart or do we sit back and go, I can't wait till you come back, Jesus, so we can give them what they deserve? Let's think that through because it should be the former, not the latter. I challenge myself in these things as much as I challenge you. And I leave these things with you because, you know, we're running out of time very, very quickly. We simply need to remember that were it not for Jesus calling us and softening our hearts toward him, we too would be in the position that those who are lost in this world are in. But he sets us up and then he sends us out. And he puts us in places where we can share that gospel and we can show people what it means. We want people to have the opportunity to hear about who Jesus is, even in the middle of them rejecting his word and all of that. They're not the enemy. No, we're press on, press on, press on. Grow in that maturity, more like Jesus. Shine as a light in a dark place. Why? Because we know it waits for us. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. 
and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Again, heaven is not the end game. Heaven isn't the end game. Paul's trying to make that really clear for us. We are citizens of a kingdom. Every one of us here. So in a sense, politics does matter. But it's kingdom politics that matter. It's not this world's politics. It's kingdom politics. I will say this in closing. That the Jesus way of justice and mercy and grace in this world is what we ought to be looking for. The Bible talks about justice. It talks about mercy. And it talks about grace. And if we avoid these topics, such as social justice, for example, because they have somehow been co-opted and been given a new perspective and reason for being by the government that we are under, I want to challenge you, church, because I love you all. That gives us no right to ignore the injustices in this world. Just because a government co-ops what the Bible tells us we ought to do. Our political leanings should never determine our biblical action. Ever. 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 We know who we serve and he's coming back. And to me that's a glorious thing. We'll end on that note. He is coming back and we ought to be the loudest voices with broken hearts but with cheerful song for the things that break God's heart because the church is the one who proclaims that our king is alive. Jesus lives. Jesus is risen from the dead. He intercedes on your behalf and he loves you passionately. Now take that truth and go out into this world and share it even with the person who thinks you're the biggest idiot walking down Main Street. Why? Because Jesus died for them too. And we have the answer to every question that they would ever ask. It's found in Christ. Even if we can't explain the whole deal, I know my Jesus lives.